So Leon Trotsky once visited the uh, comrades of the Socialist Workers' Party um, in the United States. Um, and the comrades over there were wondering, you know, what is this great revolutionary figure going to want to discuss with us? Um, could it be um, that he would want to discuss the revolutionary developments taking a place across the world uh, and in, in the United States? Could it be the <coughs> nature of the Soviet Union under Stalin? Well, no. What Trotsky insisted on discussing, first and foremost, was Marxist philosophy, um, was dialectical materialism. He held this up as a vital question that the comrades needed to have a clear understanding of. But why is this? Um, you know, it might seem uh, strange today to think, um, to think of that as being the case. Philosophy these days has quite a bad name, um, and I would include Marxist philosophy um, in with, uh, with that. To most people, I would say, philosophy does seem quite an abstract thing that has no relevance uh, to their lives, and as well as Marxist philosophy um, too. <coughs> Because, um, I would say, most you know, so-called academic Marxists, what do they write? It tends to be, um, they tend to kind of produce material that seems to be almost purposely, almost intentionally um, hard to understand, really and solely intended for um, interesting points in university seminar rooms, um, or, most importantly, to ensure a fat wallet um, for the author um, of the uh, produced work. But that is not true Marxism. Um, Marx, for example, said that philosophers have merely interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. So Marxism is a philosophy of action um, and of change. And since the agent of change, according to Marxism, is the working class, we must not kind of, you know, present the ideas of Marxism or the distorted ideas of Marxism. We shouldn't produce them, present them anyway. But we shouldn't produce, present the ideas of Marxism in a way that is unintelligible. <clears throat> but more than being a philosophy of change, Marxism provides a guide to action, um, and this is vital because just because most people aren't interested uh, in philosophy. Um, at the moment, that doesn't mean that they don't have a philosophy. Um, and actually, if you don't work hard to have your own consciously worked out philosophy, what I would say is that what will happen is that you will unconsciously merely repeat the ideas and methods of the ruling class, because they are the ideas that surround us every day. They are the ideas that are kind of fed out through the television, through uh, the newspapers. And that is ultimately what Marx meant when he said uh, that the ruling ideas in any society are the ideas of the ruling class. So working class people need our own philosophy, our own method um, in order to change um, the world, in order to combat the ideas as well of the ruling class. But before we start, I just want to say um, that Marxism is a science. Uh, and like all sciences, um, it comes with its own terminology um, and can be quite difficult when you first begin uh, to study these ideas. Um, however, after some uh, work, I would say that the philosophy of Marxism, um, better than anything else, is able to uh, explain uh, society, um, humanity, human thought, um, and nature. <coughs> um, so this talk is meant to, as an introduction to the philosophy of Marxism. But I do hope that it encourages comrades to either continue or start a uh, proper study um, of Marxist philosophy. Anyway, as I kind of indicated earlier, the philosophy of Marxism is called dialectical materialism. But both dialectics and materialism have their own history um, that predates Marxism. So what is materialism? Well, philosophically, it has a completely different meaning to what it means colloquially. Um, if someone calls you a materialist, for example, um, you might be quite offended. Um, you might think, well, I mean, what does that mean? That means, you know, you're obsessed with uh, shopping, with consuming, things like that. 
If someone calls you an idealist, on the other hand, equally it's quite patronising, but what it probably means is uh, that you are very keen on, you know, fighting for a just world, for, you know, make, to make things better, basically. That philosophically, materialism means something completely different. Philos a philosophical materialist views the material, physical world um, as primary. For a materialist, matter is the driving force of all reality. And that means that ideas, including the idea of God, are secondary. Um, <clears throat> ideas are understood as being a product of the material world, not the other way around. <clears throat> but to add to this as well, a materialist would conceive of this material world um, as having um, an objective existence that's separate and apart from our own interpretation of it. Um, the world exists whether we, personally, are there to view it or not. So in answer to the question, um, you know, if a tree falls um, in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, a materialist would answer, yes, it certainly makes a sound. Um, the, the sound that it makes is not dependent on an observer being there um, to, ob to hear um, it making a sound. <clears throat> Um, now, one of the big influence, influences for Marx and Engels and Marxism was a man named Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, this man was a, uh, a materialist, um, <coughs> and he kind of approached the question of materialism um, in this way. He said, in the conflict between materialism and spiritualism, the human head is under discussion. Once we have learnt what kind of matter the brain is made up of, we shall soon arrive at a clear <coughs> view upon all other matter, on matter in general. And Engels deals with uh, this in Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of German Classical Philosophy, which is uh, uh, available on the stall, has a terrible um, name. Um, but anyway, he deals with this. He says, what this means is that, so since thought and consciousness are products of the human brain, um, and since humanity is a product of nature, which has developed in and along with the environment, products of the human brain, ideas, in the last analysis are also products of nature. They don't contradict nature, um, but are in correspondence with it. And so for Marxists, consciousness um, really is a result of matter having become conscious of itself. Um, but you can use a materialist approach to gain a real understanding of all ideas. We root, we say all ideas have a material base, and that includes idealism itself. Um, you can find the origins of idealism, really, um, in the lack of understanding of our ancestors. Um, because the early humans, um, for example, were unable um, to understand how kind of nature worked, so therefore, they were unable to make the, make the environment generally work for them. And so in order to attain what they wanted, rather than being able to use science or technology because of this lack of understanding, instead, they had to resort with a kind of magical interaction um, with nature. <clears throat> so the anthropologist Sir James Fraser, for example, said, um, the early human hardly conceives the distinction between the natural and the supernatural. To them, the world is to a great extent worked by supernatural agents, liable to be moved by appeals to their pity. So, for the, human, for the early humans, they were forced to rely on uh, prayers in order to um, get what they wanted, basically. Um, but also, you have these early um, religions, a lot of them were known as animist religions, which um, essentially is um, the kind of attributing uh, natural processes to the actions of the gods. So you have things like, for example, uh, you know, thunder being attributed to gods playing the drums in the sky or something like that. Um, however, idealism itself also received a powerful impulse with the emergence of class society, because class society <clears throat> essentially means the division um, of labour between those who do all the manual work and those who do mental work, um, if you like. 
<clears throat> but it's important to remember, from a Marxist point of view, this division of labour, initially at least, was actually a progressive thing. Because what did it mean? Well, it meant that a certain section of society was free from having to uh, carry out manual labour and therefore had the time to develop science and technology. So, for exam example, um, Aristotle said, Mathematics originated <coughs> in Egypt, where a priestly caste enjoyed all the necessary leisure. But whilst there were obviously progressive elements, what this uh, phenomenon meant um, was that there was a certain section of society, obviously, that were free from having to carry out manual um, labour, but also their conditions of existence depended on ideas. Um, and if your, pos if your position in society depends on ideas, um, it can be very easy to come to view ideas as being the driving force um, in the world. And this battle um, between you know, materialism and idealism really, I would say, colours a lot of the history um, of philosophy. Um, and you can read um, about this. I would recommend comrades read um, <clears throat> Alan Woods, who's sitting at the back, History of uh, Philosophy. Um, and you can get it online um, if you would like to. I don't have time to go through the whole history of philosophy, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, and go to you know, materialism. It's kind of one of its big breakthroughs, if you like. Um, and this came, really, in France um, in the 18th century. Here, you had a new class that was rising, fighting to change society. Um, against a decrepit old ruling class. This was the emergence at this period of the revolutionary bourgeoisie. Um, and this class um, had their own revolutionary and materialist philosophy, which itself was the kind of ideological expression of the struggle um, against the old uh, ruling class. This basically was the creed of the French Revolution. Um, these people recognised no external authority and the measure of everything for them, instead, was reason. However, both Marx and Engels criticised this materialism. They, uh, they said that actually this materialism was too mechanical. Um, and then they also explained why it was too mechanical. And they rooted it, again, in, for material reasons, in the fact that at this point in time, the most developed form of science was mechanics. Um, and this fact um, then coloured the whole of thinking um, at that time, um, which also meant um, <coughs> that uh, this materialism was unable, basically, to grasp the fact that the universe is in a state of uh, constant change. Instead, this materialism had quite a, a static view um, of things, including um, human nature. And one of the materialists that they criticised was this man, Ludwig uh, Feuerbach. Um, this man was very important to both Marx and Engels um, <coughs> because he was someone who broke from uh, Hegel. Hegel is another influence um, of Marx and Engels, I will come back to um, later, but he broke from Hegel um, on a materialist basis. So, for example, um, Feuerbach said, before thinking of an object, man experiences its actions upon himself. Um, now, that's, that is a materialist approach, um, I would say. Um, matter is primary for Feuerbach. However, Marx criticised this. He criticised it in uh, Theses on Feuerbach. He said, <clears throat> um, the chief defect of all previous materialism, Feuerbach's included, is that things, reality, sensuousness, are conceived only in the form of the object of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity, practice, not subjectively. But what does this mean? Well, according to Feuerbach, we become aware of an object by coming under its action. Marx objects, he says, Yes, we do become aware of an object by coming under its action, but whilst also at the same time um, acting upon it. So for Marx, there's a two-way process between the object and the subject, rather than a pure uh, you know, one-way relationship from uh, the object. So for Marxists, people are induced to think 
chiefly by the sensations they experience in the process of acting upon the external world. <coughs> um, and you can see this method in the works of Marx. In uh, Capital, for example, Marx says, by thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. And this is a fundamental point, um, and it affects um, at Marxist approach to all number of questions, but I'll just give one example, which is the Marxist approach to oppression, um, and sexism in particular. Now, Marxists would say that all ideas, including uh, sexism, have um, its roots in material reality, um, class society. And there was a talk on that yesterday, so I won't go too much into detail about it. <clears throat> but we say that the sexism of workers and the sexism of the ruling class are of a different uh, character. Women are oppressed um, both as workers and as women, both by other workers and by uh, the capitalist system. However, the ruling class relies on uh, sexism and all forms of oppression in order to divide the working class. Whilst the working class, in order to struggle to change society, need unity. The point is, though, that when working class people are passive and not fighting to change society, um, <coughs> they are unaware of the need for this unity. And so that is why these ideas can um, you know, have some existence amongst working class people. However, when the working class begin to move in order to change society, they also, at the same time, begin to change themselves uh, in various ways. And one of these ways is that they learn the importance of unity whilst uh, struggling. And so that's why in big movements of the working class, you do tend to see um, ideas like this begin to lose their hold. For example, in Egypt, um, Egypt is obviously a place where the position of women is, <coughs> not, um, is a lot lower than uh, in Britain. Um, but during the Arab Spring, um, there were no sexual assaults uh, reported whatsoever, uh, and women also reported that they'd never felt safer um, than during this period. Equally, in the miners' strike in Britain, um, women, uh, you can see <coughs> there are like, lots of interviews of this, women at the start of uh, the miners' strike you know, might have been too shy, too nervous to speak in meetings, but during the struggle, the um, workers learnt the importance of unity and women began to take a leading role in the miners' strike with speaking meetings, visiting picket lines and things like this. I'd also say that it's no coincidence whatsoever that following the Russian Revolution, there were hugely progressive reforms that were carried out uh, that benefited women. So, um, I mean, I can't go into it now, but you had, for example, the uh, legalisation of abortion, um, the right to divorce being granted and countless um, other examples. But I'd argue that what these examples show is that Marx's approach to materialism was correct. Rather than there being a uh, one-way relationship between the object influencing the subject or people mechanically um, being products solely of their environment, um, he has, I would say, a, what is a dialectical approach um, where subject and object simultaneously influence each other. So materialism needed dialectics, but what is um, dialectics? Well, the first dialectician came a little bit before uh, Marx. Um, his name was Heraclitus. He uh, was a philosopher from ancient Greece. He was born in 535 BC. And he was famous for saying a number of very profound things. Um, I'll give two examples. Uh, the first of which is, we both step and do not step in the same river twice. We are and are not. Uh, and also, everything changes and nothing remains still. His thinking was that we can't step in the same river twice because the, both the river is constantly changing and we also are constantly changing. And if you think about it, it is true. The river is constantly changing. If you try and step into it twice, the water will be different. Also, the banks of the river are constantly moving because uh, due to erosion, the river itself might become, be becoming uh, more shallow or more deep. But also, we are constantly changing. Um, you know, if I was to show you a picture of myself as a baby, you probably wouldn't recognise me. 
Um, but more than that, um, I am constantly changing. Uh, cells in my body are constantly dying and being replaced by new ones. So, yeah, everything is constantly changing, basically. And that is one of the key points um, of dialectics, that everything is the constant state of flux. But this idea, ultimately, or, well, this idea means that dialectics comes into conflict with, um, the tra with a traditional form of logic, with formal logic. Um, and the laws of formal logic were kind of formulated um, by Aristotle um, in kind of three points. First of all, A is always equal to A. Um, a is, uh, <coughs> A can never be equal to not A. Um, and A is either A or not A. There can be no uh, middle way. Um, on the face of it, this does seem to make total sense, right? A cup is a cup. Um, if you started calling a cup a spade, um, people would think you're slightly strange. Um, <coughs> however, Trotsky pointed out that actually um, A is never equal to A. If you take two one kilogram bags of sugar, for example, um, on the face of it, they seem completely equal. However, if you use a fine, if a more uh, accurate weighing scales, you will find that there are slight differences between the weight of the two bags. <clears throat> but even if you say a bag of sugar is equal to itself, that also doesn't help. Because as, as I've said, all bodies are in a constant state of uh, flux. <clears throat> um, because if you look more closely at this bag of sugar, you can see that the particles themselves are constantly moving, constantly reacting with the atmosphere. But equally, even more than this, you can't say that a bag of sugar is equal to itself at a given moment. <clears throat> because even in the smallest interval of time, uh, all things are constantly changing. Um, he also says, can you say that a bag of sugar is equal to itself when time is zero? Well, he says, um, all, thing <clears throat> all things exist in time. So whilst that's true in abstract thinking, it can't be true in real life. Um, it would, if by saying that, all it would mean really is that A is equal to A if it does not exist in time, um, if it does not change, um, which basically, if it does not exist. Now whilst dialectics does uh, oppose formal logic, that doesn't mean that you know, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. <coughs> we still uh, would say that formal logic has its uses. Um, you know, you'd have a hard time shopping for a recipe in the supermarket, wouldn't you, if you <laughs> disagree with formal logic in its entirety. Um, essentially, formal logic is true, but it's true within certain limits. Um, you can go to a, um, a, a supermarket and buy a kilo of sugar, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but, um, and you, you know, you will know that it's not exactly equal to one kilo um, of sugar, but that doesn't matter provided the discrepancy isn't too big. Um, so that means for everyday operations, when, you know, change is not very big, um, formal logic can suffice. However, there are moments when small quantitative changes um, can cause a radical rupture in the very nature of the thing um, or process, whatever we're considering. And it's here where the, form, the laws of formal logic actually begin to break down. And you can see this with um, when you try and boil uh, a quantity of water. You can gradually heat this water from zero to 100 degrees. And it seems, yes, gradually, the heat of the water increases. Um, however, once you hit the 100 degree mark, there is a radical, sudden change in the very nature of the water, and it ceases to be water altogether. So that means that the change from 99 to 100 degrees of the water is completely different from the change from 98 <coughs> uh, to 99. And to understand this, we do need a new form um, of logic. But it's not one that completely disregards the old, it's one that enriches it. Um, Trotsky actually compared the relationship between formal and dialectical logic to that between a still photo and a video. Um, you know, 
we have video, um, but it doesn't completely uh, negate the kind of all need for photos. All that video does is provide a, uh, a greater appreciation of reality um, than the photo. <clears throat> um, so this phenomenon of small quantitative changes um, leading to a qualitative change is also one of the main uh, laws of dialectics, and it has lots of applications. It's reflected in, uh, you know, kind of popular sayings like uh, "the straw that broke the camel's back," but it's also um, incredibly important to uh, keep this in our minds in our political activism. Um, if you take a strike, for example, now every single day, most workers are treated like rubbish by their <coughs> bosses, um, and every day, workers tend to put up with it. <coughs> and this can lead some people to say, well, look, the working class are backward, and they're uneducated, they're bourgeoisified. Um, we need a different actor in order to bring about uh, change. But then, suddenly, one uh, innocuous thing, one wage cut, one uh, you know, alteration to terms and conditions, one insult from management can provide the spark um, that <coughs> you know, changes things in its entirety. And that is because every uh, wage cut, every insult by management is causing a steady build-up um, of anger and resentment under the surface. And all that's needed is a, one spark, um, eventually, um, to produce a change uh, in consciousness. So <clears throat> we need to look beyond the surface of, uh, of calm. Um, although that seems a bit redundant these days, given <laughs> if you turn on the news. <coughs> anyway, um, yes, I'd say this it is very important to have a dialectical approach. Um, in, our, in our kind of political activism. Um, and uh, a good example of this um, was told to me of a story involving Jim Brookshaw. Now, I really hope that I've got this, uh, this right, because Hazel Brookshaw is here. Um, but don't tell him if I've got this <laughs> um, anecdote slightly wrong. Anyway, um, so Jim is a supporter of Socialist Appeal. He's here um, at this event. Um, and he was a, uh, a print worker. He was open about his communist uh, views, um, but the other workers didn't come over to his uh, views initially, right? Um, but because of this, he, he didn't change his views in order to uh, appeal to how the workers were at that moment in time. He put forward his case in a friendly, reasonable way, in a language that his colleagues could understand. <clears throat> and then, when a strike was called, and the old leadership was shown to be ineffective, he was suddenly put into the leadership of this strike. That's quite a radical leap in consciousness, right? Um, but there are no bigger leaps, I would say, um, than in human history, I would say, than revolutions. Um, and as I said, I mean, as I uh, indicated earlier, you're quite spoilt for choice when you want to give a concrete example of a recent revolution. But I'll pick um, Algeria. So Algeria was a place where you know, not much was happening for quite some time. Um, even the Arab Spring in 2011 left the country uh, relatively untouched. However, that didn't mean that there wasn't anger bubbling away under the surface. And eventually, um, you had the ruler, Bouteflika, um, who was... <coughs> You talk about the decrepit ruling class. I mean, this guy um, was so, I mean, he couldn't even speak. So he announced that he was going to stand for a fourth term, or his handlers announced that he was going to stand for a fourth term. And this set off a spark, um, essentially. It, well, it was the spark that set off um, the Algerian revolution. Um, this was quantity turning into quality, a sudden, small incident that provoked um, a revolution. And clearly, these facts can't be accounted for by formal logic. If A equals A, if the working class equal passive, um, or equal uh, backward or apathetic, whatever terminology you want to use, um, then how do you ever appreciate that you know, things can change, um, essentially? Um, <clears throat> you can't um, understand that these kind of 
uh, small quantitative changes can lead to a sudden uh, qualitative change if you solely use um, formal logic. But equally, formal logic, I would say, is incapable of understanding movement. Um, <clears throat> and this is demonstrated in quite a funny way um, by this philosopher Zeno um, of Elia. And this philosopher set out to prove that movement was impossible. Um, and he had a number of paradoxes <coughs> to prove that movement was impossible. Um, I'll give two here, if I can. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, um, Achilles is in a race with a tortoise. Achilles, obviously, runs a little bit quicker than the tortoise, so he gives the tortoise a 100-metre head start. And they both run at constant speeds, but in the time, once Achilles has covered that first 100 metres, the tortoise has covered 10 metres, so the lead is 10 metres. Then Achilles covers that extra 10 metres, and the tortoise is one metre ahead. And Zeno points out that this will carry on forever, with the lead getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but Achilles never being able to take over the tortoise. He also gave another example um, of this, Thanks. Um, which was a, uh, <clears throat> an archer firing um, an arrow towards a target. Um, he says that at every instant of the arrow's journey from the archer towards the target, at every instant the arrow is neither moving to where it is nor moving to where it is not. Actually, at every instant, the arrow is still. And since time is entirely composed of instants, that must mean that motion is completely impossible. Um, <clears throat> it was proved wrong, actually, which is quite funny, by someone just getting up and walking around. Um, <laughs> um, funny at the time. Anyway, <clears throat> what I would say that this demonstrates is not obviously that movement is impossible, but it demonstrates that formal logic is incapable of appreciating movement. Um, and Hegel actually answered uh, Zeno's paradoxes um, by saying, he said, actually, it's contradiction that is the source of all movement and life. And only insofar as it contains a contradiction can anything have movement, power, and effect. So, to solve this problem of the arrow, um, Hegel says, Movement means to be in this place and not be in it. This is the continuity of space and time, and it's this which makes movement possible. So, essentially, what Hegel is saying is that when the arrow is moving through the air, it is both where it is and where it is not. Something moves, this is Hegel again, something moves not because it is here at one point of time and there at another, but because at one and the same time it is here and not here. <clears throat> and I'd say this demonstrates another one of the uh, main laws of dialectics, which is whilst formal logic, as I said earlier, um, says that A is either A or not A, um, dialectics says that A is A and not A at the same time. It sounds a bit weird, I know, but it posits that at the heart of all uh, things is contradiction, and contradiction drives development and change. Um, and you can see Marx used this in his method. Um, uh, if people caught Nelson's um, talk on Marxist economics yesterday, you'll have heard this already, but Marx begins capital by investigating the fundamental building block of capitalism, which he calls the commodity. And what is the commodity? It's a contradiction between use value and exchange value. He also uses this method in his approach to society. Um, he says the history... Um, he says that the history of all hitherto existing societies, um, excluding pre-class society, is the history of class struggle. And it's this struggle um, between the exploiters and the exploited over the surplus which drives the development um, of society. <coughs> you can see this phenomenon in nature as well. Um, if you take, uh, you know, within cells, for example, you have both um, electrons and neutrons which are positively um, and negatively charged. <clears throat> but more importantly for us, um, I would say, you can use this approach to gain a better understanding in our kind of day-to-day -day political life. If we take the UK Labour Party, for example, this party is both um, a party with workers in it and also a part of the uh, bourgeois, um, of bourgeois politics, basically. 
Um, and it's this contradiction between, on the one hand, the influence of working class people who enter the party in order to try and change it into something that can improve their lives, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the representatives of the ruling class who want to do all that they can to avoid that happening, that contradiction drives the development of the party. And it can drive it in both progressive um, and reactionary di di uh, directions. <coughs> so when the working class are not active um, in their party, um, the ruling class, through their representatives, can take a greater hold of the party. And you did see that with uh, Blair, for example, um, where <coughs> because there was a lack of um, you know, people holding the uh, kind of structures of the Labour Party to account, Blair and his cronies were able to drive the Labour Party to the right. Um, and he was able to get quite far in trying to change the nature of the party from, uh, into a liberal party, essentially. However, when the working class are active and involved in the party, um, they can enter the party and replace the old leaders. Um, and drive it significantly to the left. And that's, I would say, what's hap what we've seen, basically, in front of our eyes. Um, you've had hundreds of thousands of people join the Labour Party in order to <coughs> elect Jeremy Corbyn um, as the leader. And obviously, this process is still taking place, but they have driven the party very far to the left. <coughs> um, but this isn't the whole story for dialectics, because when things change, how do they change? Um, and that is something, obviously, that's answered by dialectics as well. Um, because dialectics posits that uh, when things change, we see the re-emergence of old characteristics, but on a higher level. Um, and there are plenty of examples of this phenomenon, but I'll give um, a couple. We see this in history, um, and Marx explains this. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a time before classes, in pre-class society. Um, and in free class society, you had uh, common ownership of the means of production, if you can call it that, because obviously it was a very low level um, of development. However, with the development of agriculture, um, I'm kind of racing through this, but there was a talk on historical materialism earlier this morning. But with the development of agriculture um, and the ability to produce a surplus, this enabled um, essentially the negation of uh, common ownership, and you had the emergence of private ownership of the means of production. Um, now, Marxists viewed this as actually progressive because it led to the development of the productive forces. But then, a socialist revolution would then be the negation of private ownership of the means of production and the return of the old, you know, uh, common ownership of the means of production. But it wouldn't be a return exactly to how things were uh, in pre-class society, because you'd have the return of common ownership, but enriched by the development of the productive forces. <clears throat> um, you can also see this phenomenon at play in the development of Marxism itself. Um, so as I pointed out, the materialism of the 18th century was very mechanical. mechanical. Um, and because of this, uh, a lot of the kind of big developments in uh, philosophy at that time actually happened within the idealistic, idealist school. Um, and one of these people who developed philosophy hugely was Hegel, who was himself um, an idealist. <coughs> um, so Hegel was limited by the fact that he was an idealist, but he still uh, kind of hugely developed philosophy with his uh, development of the dialectical method, basically. Um, and Marx points this out. He says, to Hegel, the life processes of the human brain, the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject, is the creator of the real world. And the real world, for Hegel, is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. With me, with Marx, um, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. So what Marx essentially does is then, again, negate um, idealism by returning to materialism. But he didn't return to the old materialism. He returned to materialism that had been enriched by the developments um, of, uh, of or the acquisitions of idealism. <coughs> um, 
Now, Marxism explains that there are certain laws that operate in society, um, and these can be studied and understood. This is quite controversial for some people. Um, <laughs> some people, for some reason, um, say there can be no laws within human society because we all have free will. There are, um, you know, there are certain laws that operate in nature, but for some reason humanity is completely separate from nature um, and therefore there are no laws and we can't uh, study um, how human society works. <coughs> but Engels answers this in, uh, in, in Ludwig Feuerbach again, um, and he says, yes, every individual is endowed with consciousness <laughs> and acts towards definite goals. Um, but regardless of every individual's consciously uh, desired aim, um, on the surface, accident appears to reign. I'm paraphrasing Engels here. Um, <clears throat> because what an individual person wills for themselves, actually that rarely happens. Um, what this means is that this, what Engels calls, a conflict of innumerable wills in the domain of history produces a state of affairs which actually is analogous to that which uh, obtains in nature. That means there are certain laws that operate in society. They can be under, uh, studied and they can be understood. Um, and if you can understand the laws that operate in society, you can make certain predictions as to how society will develop. Um, a good kind of example, which is not particularly controversial, is, um, well, if I introduce that right, but car accidents. Um, so <laughs> we can't really know um, whether we as individuals will be involved in a car accident tomorrow. However, you can make predictions or as to how many car accidents that will occur in London over the next year. Because there are patterns that exist, there are laws that exist um, in society, I would argue. Marxists argue that actually all of our actions are determined, um, but because they are determined by countless influences, um, it is probably impossible to make predictions for like on an individual basis. But this changes, as with the example of the, um, car accidents, this changes when you consider society as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and that is why, by studying the history of the working class, by studying the history of the class struggle, um, you're able to get an idea as to what might happen um, in the future. <clears throat> um, but as I said, to come back to this question of free will, um, now, what I would say, what Marxists say, is that um, if you think um, by free will, um, if you define it as being um, completely free from all external uh, forces that determine your decision, um, then unfortunately you've never had free will um, and you never will have free will. Um, <clears throat> instead, Marxists go with Hegel's definition of freedom, which means that freedom is the appreciation of necessity. What this means um, is that to be truly free, a good understanding of the objective laws that act within history and nature is necessary. Because once you understand these, these laws, you can make them work for you. Um, so a good example of this is uh, the law of gravity. Now, we can't wish away the law of gravity. I can't just hope that gravity doesn't exist, jump out the window and fly uh, to France, right? However, we as humanity have studied the laws of gravity, we've studied the laws of uh, aerodynamics and all the rest of it, and so actually we've been able to make these laws work for us and so we can fly uh, to France. <coughs> um, and this, I would say, is, an, there is a certain analogy, or kind of, it's similar to our task in politics, basically. Um, because in order to change the world, um, we need to understand the laws that operate within society. <clears throat> um, and the best way to understand these laws is by using the method of Marxism, is by using dialectical materialism. Dialectical materialism, I would say, underpins the whole of Marxism. Um, Marxist economics, really, is the application of this method to the field of economics. Uh, the historical materialism is the application of this method to the field of history. Um, and ultimately, that, I would say, is why um, Leon Trotsky was so keen uh, to ensure that the Socialist Workers' Party had a good understanding 
of dialectics. And that is why I think we should all uh, strive consciously to have a good understanding um, of dialectical materialism. Um, you know, it's not for nothing that Lenin said that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Um, so I hope that we all um, can kind of take from this talk that we need to build a revolutionary movement that's built on the solid foundations of Marxism um, and Marxist philosophy. Because without this, or with this, um, it would be the only way uh, that we can ensure that we'll lead the working class uh, to victory in Britain, in Europe, um, and the world.